This material has been reproduced and communicated to you by or on behalf of Deakin University in accordance with Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. The material in this communication may be subject to copyright under the Act. Any further reproduction or communication of this material by you may be the subject of copyright protection under the Act. Do not remove this notice. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me comfortably. Uh, if there are any students accessing remotely, uh, if you could let me know whether you can um, hear me and see the uh, PowerPoint slides. If there's anyone accessing remotely, uh, please unmute and let me know whether you can um, Hear me and see the slides. Someone, please. Oh. Oh, just a moment. Welcome to Zoom. Please press pound, then enter your meeting ID, followed by the pound sign again. Recording in progress. Mm, sorry, it's so loud. Uh, okay, good morning, uh, students accessing remotely. Uh, can any of you let me know, can one of you let me know, please, if you can see the slides? And oh, just a moment. All right, um, students accessing remotely. For example, Josh. Oh, here's someone who's responded. Yep, you can see them, great. Okay, well, we should be right to go. Okay, I'm just trying to get some the slides to appear on both screens behind me, but they're only appearing on one, and I don't know why. Okay. 
anyway, we'll have to get underway. Okay. Uh, all right. So, okay, we'll um, begin, please. All right, we start with the um, acknowledgement of the traditional landowners. Okay, guys, please, the back, let's start, please. Deakin Business School would like to acknowledge that the site of the Burwood campus is located on the land of the Wurundjeri people, the Geelong Waterfront campus is located on the land of the Lathoron people, and the Warrnambool campus is located on the land of the Gunchimara people. They belong to these lands, have walked on them for thousands of years, and continue to care for them and nurture them. Okay, here we are, we're beginning week one. Uh, okay, this slide just tells you the um, times of the classes. Uh, a deacon, lectures are known as classes, tutorials are known as seminars. Uh, the, normally, this class will occur on Tuesdays. So it's only because there was a, a public holiday on Tuesday this week, Melbourne Cup Day, that this class did not take place at the normal time. So please don't come back to this room at this time next Friday. Um, this class from next week onwards will be on Tuesdays in this room at this same time, 11 a.m. Okay, and as you see, it's recorded. Uh, students can access remotely as they are now and um, this recording can be listened to at any time from now on. They normally take about an hour or so to be processed so that you can start listening to them at about an hour after the completion of the class. Uh, the seminars for in-person uh, on campus, uh, you should be notified that your, um, the time of your uh, seminar, it sh I believe it's one o'clock today with me. Uh, it's the other side of the creek, so you cross the footbridge. Um, for online students, the weekly seminars are Wednesdays at 6 p.m. <coughs> but uh, they are recorded and even if you're not an on, uh, on, off-campus student, you can still uh, attend an online seminar if you wish and you can listen to recordings of them at any time. Okay, uh, Faru Tiba is the unit chair. Um, if you wish to speak uh, with someone one-to-one, -one, he is your contact and that's his email address. Okay, uh, please aim to do the reading uh, as, as much of the reading that you can before you come to these classes. I was a deacon student myself once and I was a student in this very lecture, very lecture hall, this very theatre. And I remember uh, after about 15, 20 minutes being quite overwhelmed with all the new content. I studied law and I studied commerce. And, uh, but it was, I found it was far more effective for me if I had done some preparation, done some reading before I came so that I, under, I had an understanding of what it was that it was that was to be taught to me. Don't expect that you will understand it all the first time you read it. You probably won't. Um, this is the sort of content that you have to read a few times. You have to reflect upon it. It needs some time for your mind to digest. So don't panic if you don't re um, understand it the first time. But if you at least know what the lecturer is going to be talking about, it's much easier for you uh, to take in that information during the hour and 20 minute long class. As I say, if you don't, usually about 15, 20 minutes, you may find it all very um, overwhelming. All right, then what is, uh, we have the, um, the lecture, the class, new content is taught to you. There are exercises um, that deal with that content in the seminars, but what is taught to you in one week will be put to you in seminar exercises in the following week. So you have a week between when the content is taught to you and uh, when you will look at exercises involving that content. So if we just fast forward a few weeks into the future 
and um, we're here on a Tuesday teaching you about um, corporation about um, consumer law. The seminar questions dealing with consumer law will be in that following week. Okay. Uh, the textbook. This is what the textbook looks like. Okay. Uh, the details are on the slide there. Um, I wish I could get that other screen open for you. Anyway, okay, that's the, um, the name of the book, Concise Australian Commercial Law, Turner, Train and Gamble. Gamble was one of the taught contract law here for many years. Um, please note that the current edition is the seventh edition. This is the edition to get. It's the up-to-date version. You will see other versions that are earlier versions, sixth, fifth edition, they'll be much cheaper. But the reason why they're much cheaper is because they're out of date. So um, students come to me, is it all right if I use an out of, you know, a previous edition? Well, you won't know what is up to date and what isn't. There'll be many new cases, new rules in here that are not in previous editions. So if you're getting a previous edition, in effect, you're getting a book with holes in it, okay? So uh, I advise you not to do that. Uh, all right. Um, the exam at the end is open book. You cannot get through this subject without access to the textbook. Um, the rules... Okay, we're, there are PowerPoint slides and they give you the bare bones, the bare outline uh, of the rules that are taught to you. But they're just a few words in bullet point form. It's not an... They will not... They, the content in the PowerPoint slides is not and cannot be enough for you to be able to um, get a proper full appreciation of the law. Okay. So... Um, and particularly for the assignments, you'll need to um, be able to research information which is in this book. So please don't just rely on the PowerPoint slides. They won't, they, they won't be enough. Okay. Uh, once you get the book, do um, familiarise yourself with uh, how it's laid out. You'll see that toward the beginning there are tables of cases. So if you want to look up a case... Um, You'll see how they how to do that. Equally, the same for legislation. Uh, the list of contents at the back, index, and so on. Okay, uh, Cloud Deacon. If we come back to Cloud Deacon now. On. I'll just bring us up to, okay. On any page that you're at, you will constantly have this uh, row of tabs at the top, home, content, discussion, assessment, and so on. So currently I'm on content, and I've clicked on week one, and... Uh, Click on week one, scroll down a bit. Main, feature, main things to look out for in the weekly content, in the pages for each week. Scroll down and you'll see the PowerPoint slides. They're the slides that I'm reading from. Okay. Uh, scroll down here. And you see the compulsory reading. It refers to this textbook. It tells you which chapter or chapters are relevant for this for that week. Please note, do you see where I'm um, moving the cursor? 
you can actually access an online copy of this textbook through the Deakin Library. However, there's important limitations to be aware of. There's only about four or six students, unfortunately, who can access the book at one time. So if all of you click on this now, most of you will get a response saying, um, try again later. Uh, also, during the, an exam period, it's inaccessible. Often the libraries are closed during the exam period, um, but even if they were open, there's still the limitation on only about four or six students who can access the book at a given time. Uh, you, can, you cannot print from the online copy and you cannot download. All right. So what I suggest you do is obtain a copy of the book yourself, a private copy. You can get either a hard copy or a soft copy or both. Uh, if you go to the publisher's um, website, and there it is, Thomson Reuters, I believe you may be able to get a discount uh, for being a student. Okay? Whereas if you buy it off Booktopia or Amazon, you may not. Okay. All right, back to the Cloud Deacon site. Scroll down here, and every week, seminar activities and resources. You'll see a document underneath there. Click on that and you will see what the questions are that we will be going through in that seminar. Now obviously we haven't, there isn't any, there aren't any questions, exercises uh, set for today because there was no class last week. However, today in the seminar, as I did on the online seminar, I'll be going through some very important information. The methodology that you must follow when you're answering questions in this subject. It's known as IRAC, okay? So please uh, note that, very important information in the seminar this week. It tells you how to lay out your answers in the forthcoming seminars. Once the week is completed, the suggested answers are also posted here. So as we progress through the semester, in a, if you look at a week that has passed, you'll be able to look down. By the time you get to week five, you can look back and see week four, seminar, seminar four exercises, seminar four answers. So they're provided at the end of the week. All right. If you scroll back up to the top, discussion, please click on that. Discussion board. Now, this is your primary uh, avenue of communication with your, um, so if you have any queries, comments, this is where to put, to post your question and where your question will be answered. Okay, they're answered by the unit chair. So unit and administrative questions. So as you see already, some students have asked questions and those questions have been answered. Please read through that at least once a week. Even if you don't have a question yourself, it's important to follow this because there is information there that's relevant to you. If you do have a question, please read through first to see whether that question has already been asked and therefore answered. If it hasn't, then post your question here. That's the university's policy. Rather than coming to an individual teacher and getting an individual answer, the policy of the university is that students' questions go to be posted there, then all students have the benefit of the answer. All right, so that's for unit and administrative questions. But as you see below, uh, also the librarian, um, there are so far, there is information that has been posted by the libra li librarian, Michelle Bendel. She's great. She was the law librarian when I was a student here many years ago. So it shows the 
that reflects the experience that she has in um, how the library works and in the experience that she has in assisting students over those years. So please read through that. Uh, questions on the assessments, assignments. And then these are the different topics that we'll be going through over the various weeks. So if you have a question on consumer protection laws, you can post it under the relevant heading there. All right. Okay, so back to week, uh, back to the PowerPoint slides now. Cloud Deacon, as I've gone through. Okay. Uh, these are the areas that we're, um, uh, just a quick overview of some of the content that we're, we're going through. Topic one today is the Australian legal system. So uh, after these introductory slides, I'll be giving you some information on how the Australian legal system works. Most people are not aware of it. Um, what is the law? Is the law, um, you'll see that in some instances, the law is what a case says it is, an actual court case. In other times, it's what legislation or an act of parliament says. Sometimes, and, but usually it's a combination of both. Uh, but you'll see that parliament, which parliament? That in Australia we have many parliaments. There's Parliament House in Spring Street in Melbourne on top of Parliament Station. There's, par excuse me, Parliament House in Canberra. Uh, there's um, a Premier in Victoria. There's a Prime Minister in Canberra. So there's a Premier in New South Wales. How does it all work? So that's just this week. And then after that, for four weeks, okay, for four weeks, we go over contract law. So that starts from next week and it continues for four weeks. It's a major component. All right. After that, consumer protection laws. After that, law of tort. Now, tort is a heading. It includes defamation, trespass, but there's one area that we deal with and focus on in particular, and that's the law of negligence. Okay. And then uh, the last topic, business relationships. That deals with partnerships, agency, and company law. Okay, uh, I'll leave you to read through that content. I've mentioned that, mentioned that, and that, and that. Okay, students are expected to spend about 13 and a half hours a week undertaking study for this unit. Some students ask, how long should I give to there? Well, there's a figure for you. Okay. Guys, are we concentrating, please? Concentrating, please. I need your focus here during the class time and during the seminars, okay? So when you're here, please be prepared to stay focused on the content. When we finish, we finish. But when we're here, we stay focused on this, okay? If you lose your concentration here, it's very difficult to get back on track, okay? Let me tell you that we have a failure rate of about a third. And the reason why students say that they fail is that they didn't, uh, didn't appreciate how much reading was associated, was, was needed, required for this. And it's not just passive reading like reading a novel. It's reading of information that's quite dense. It's almost like computer code in a way. It's not written to be nice and, uh, uh, you know, an easy read to reflect on it, to understand it, to listen to the teacher who is explaining it to you, to follow through the exercises that applies that rule to a given situation so that when you go into assignments and exams, you can handle it yourself. Okay? 
But if you go into assignments or exams and you've only got your head around a handful of rules, you'll find it very difficult to pass. Okay. 13 and a half hours a week. If students ever ask me how much time should I give to this, my answer is always as much time as you possibly can. But please don't think I will just do all the study for this in one day. I couldn't sit, I couldn't sit down and study new laws for eight hours. Okay. The best approach is to do a few hours and at least two and as frequently as you can. So two hours one day, and if you can, two hours the next day or soon after and again and again. But it's much two hours over four days, each day over four days, it's much better than trying to do eight hours in one day. Okay. And if you get behind, each week gives you, in each week there is a week's work. So if you're behind two weeks, three weeks, well, it's very difficult for you to do three weeks of work in one week. And the clock doesn't stop while you catch up. So um, it's very important that you appreciate that now before we go into, uh, further into this. No one's behind at the moment. All right. Uh, there are weekly quizzes that you can um, undertake on Cloud Deacon, um, but uh, they are not, you might get a score, but they do not contribute to your final mark. In the final exam, there may be a multiple choice section, but there are written questions as well, which are about at least four written questions. All right. Uh, assessment one, I believe. This morning, the details of that have been released on Cloud Deacon on the home page. Okay, assessment one, questions and instructions released. Uh, that's 20% of your mark. And it will be, uh, okay, so 750 words, 20% of your mark in the upcoming weeks. After that assessment two, um, 30%. And then assessment three, the exam at the end. Okay. Now there are the assessment, both assessment one and assessment two are in two parts. So assessment one, one part is your written response, but the other part is an online quiz that you have to undertake. So it's in two parts. Assessment two, there's a written uh, part, but there's also an online module that you have to complete first. If you haven't completed that, the system is not going to accept your written submission. Okay? Uh, and then the exam at the end, uh, which will be 50%. You only need 50% overall mark to pass the subject. So if you fail one assessment by five marks, but the next assessment you get a pass plus five marks, well, you're even. All right, so that's enough of the introductory information. Now I'll be going through um, content on the Australian legal system and legal systems in general. Okay. What is law? Are all rules law? What factors set law apart from other uh, rules? Well, in the, law, the laws, you may... You see kids in playgrounds. They say, okay, we're going to play a game and they agree upon what the rules will be. And then if someone doesn't follow the rules, the others may say you're excluded from the game. But 
they are not laws. So you can't take one of those participants to court. Laws are rules that are upheld by the state, created by the state and upheld by the state. Okay, there are various uh, functions of law in society. I won't go through them all, uh, but just one or two. They provide rules and structures for dispute resolution. So if you go to court, if you want to take legal action against someone, there are rules that you have to follow in doing that. If you go into court, it's not just like a, a free-for-all. There are rules, um, many, many rules that have to be followed there. Uh, as we know, laws reinforce basic community values. Many uh, uh, things that um, the community finds uh, unacceptable happen to be in law. Okay. Rule of law. Now, uh, this pyramid here, many functions. Many, these are aspects of our legal system. Equality before the law. Now, once upon a time, what the law was and whether it applied and how it applied depended on whether on your, your position in society. If you were an aristocrat, many laws did not apply to you, in even, but, uh, whereas they did on, for the ordinary person. Um, we don't have that anymore. Checks and balances on use of power, uh, that's a, a, a key component of uh, our um, legal system, Parliament may pass a law and then uh, that law might be challenged in the courts and the court might may well find that the Parliament did not have the power to make that law. Okay, uh, presumption of innocence in our system, uh, it's relevant in criminal law that uh, you are innocent until proven guilty. Uh, some of the different, uh, there are many parts of the, of the law, many aspects to it, but uh, criminal law is one that we are certainly aware of. We see it in TV shows all the time, TV dramas, but we don't deal with criminal law here. Uh, law for commerce is largely uh, civil aspects of law. Law of contract, consumer law agency and so on. The law is dynamic. In that, by that I, I mean that it changes. Um, new laws are brought in, um, both in legislation and uh, new court cases. All right. Australia's legal system in the beginning. Uh, as we know, uh, there was British settlement colonisation of the Australian continent. In um, 1770, Captain Cook came here and declared that at least the eastern part of the Australian continent uh, would be lands of Great Britain or England at the time. And then in 12, 18 years later, after, after the British lost the American colonies in the uh, War of Independence there in 1776, the British decided to actually start colonisation of uh, Australia. 1788, uh, the first fleet. Ships were sent here. Um, and they were largely convicts sent here to do work, to set up the colony, to punish them, but also to use their labour to set up uh, infrastructure here. Obviously, there were people here already. However, the British uh, and, the, and the British had, like other European nations, had different methods of dealing with the situation where they would colonise land that, that already belonged to other people. In New Zealand, for example, uh, a treaty was negotiated between the British and the Maori, pop the indigenous population there, the Maori. The Treaty of Waitangi was uh, entered into. And that was uh, a set of laws that set out how 
the two are going to live on the same land. That did not happen in Australia. Or you may say it hasn't happened yet because there are the, go there are the beginnings of the process of creation of one, at least in Victoria. Okay. What happened in Australia was the doctrine of terra nullius was applied, which said officially this land belongs to no one already. The basis for that was that uh, in the eyes of the British, the local people, the Aborigines, uh, had a lifestyle that was too dissimilar from that of the British. They didn't have established towns. They didn't uh, engage in agriculture. They didn't trade to the extent that the British did. Um, and they were more... Uh, What's the word? Um, nomadic. They would come and go as the climate changed, which is very sensible in Australia because you can get a, a long drought when suddenly it won't rain for five or ten years. But that doctrine was applied, terra nullius, and there was no one there to challenge it, to take it to, um, them to court, the British to court, to challenge it. So it was applied and that was that. The effect of that was that no Aborigines had any right to any land anywhere in the continent, despite the fact that they had been here for tens of thousands of years. So if the British wanted to um, occupy some land and there were some uh, locals there, they were just driven off and they had no legal recourse at all. all right. By 1992, that was challenged in court, at the High Court, in a famous case known as the Marbo case. And quite interestingly, the High Court held that the doctrine of terra nullius back in 1788 was incorrectly applied. It should not have been applied. The High Court acknowledged that it was too late to turn the clock back and start again. But what it did do is that it recognised that there are still some parts of Australia where the Indigenous populations continue to live where they always have or they conduct an activity such as fishing where they always have in rivers or in the seas and they now have native title which is a, a legal right to be able to continue doing what they're doing on that land. That only applies to land that has not been carved up and sold for example, land where we are here. All right. uh, very interesting information uh, there for you to read through um, in those uh, links. All right, so the colony, uh, Australia began as a British colony, but not the entire continent initially. It was only the eastern half. And it was thought at the time that maybe the Dutch um, would colonise the western part of Australia if they so chose. But the British initially were just interested in the eastern half. And they set up a colony, and the colony's name was New South Wales. But it extended everywhere from the top of what is today Queensland right through to what is today Tasmania, including here. The first settlements were in Sydney and in Hobart, but it was the one colony initially, New South Wales. Uh, but further activity started to um, be undertaken in um, the Brisbane River and particularly here in Melbourne when Tasmanian, um, Tasmania after a number of years uh, first was the first colony to break away from New South Wales and become a second colony. Because, and a large reason, a major reason for that was distance. So from Sydney to Hobart is a long way, and in the 1700s it was an enormous distance. So it was agreed that they could be a separate colony. Then some pastoralists from Tasmania came to Victoria and they found that they could make much more money from sheep and wool in Victoria than they could in Tasmania. And in those days, that was enormous income. 
uh, was derived from that uh, because the Industrial Revolution was underway in England and they had enormous demand for raw materials, wool from Australia and Argentina and cotton from the south of the US. So a lot of money was made here and then in no time at all, gold was discovered in Victoria. One of the largest gold rushes, if not the largest ever in human history. So enormous money is being mined in Victoria and Victoria then broke away in the 1855, I think it was, as a new colony. Queensland, the same. So by the mid-1850s, you went from having one colony, New South Wales, to several colonies. But those colonies were all answerable to Britain. They were not independent nations, the colonies of Britain. But they had no more in common with each other than, say, Australia does with New Zealand or Canada today. So they started making rules for themselves and they, those rules could be different from the rules in other colonies. And at times that caused problems. And still today, the train tracks, the width between the train tracks varies from state to state in Australia. In New South Wales, the tracks are this wide. In Victoria, they're that wide. In Queensland, they're more narrow. So it was recognised that some coordination was needed amongst these colonies. And another reason, of course, was defence. If the French, and it was feared at the time, that if the French um, were to invade part of Australia, Queensland, for example, there would be no way of defending uh, that because there was no national um, armed force. So toward the end of the 1800s, there was talk of creation of some national government. But the people in the colonies didn't want to return to the days of New South Wales where you just have the one colony for the whole country. They wanted their independent um, state, their independent identity, their ability to make local laws for themselves, but they did also want some form of national government. How was it going to work? went through a process of lengthy debates in all the colonies in the 1890s and agreement was reached that, so that by the 1st of January 1901, a law was passed in 1900 that had the effect of bringing in a new nation on the 1st of January 1901 and that new nation was named the Commonwealth of Australia. The colonies were not um, abolished. Instead, the colonies were renamed, relabeled as states. So the colony of Victoria became the state of Victoria. Colony of New South Wales, state of New South Wales, and so on. By this time, Western Australia had been colonised by the British, not by the Dutch, and it too, at the last minute, joined um, the Commonwealth. New Zealand initially was interested but decided against it. Okay. But how was it going to work? If the, parli if the states had lawmaking bodies, state parliaments, and the Commonwealth had a state parliament, how was it, a Commonwealth had its own parliament, how was it all going to work? Well, one law was created there called the Constitution, the Commonwealth Constitution, which sets out how the lawmaking is to be shared. The name Federation um, is applicable there because Federation is like working together. We have a federal legal system, which means right here, Deacon Burwood, the laws of Victoria apply to us but the laws of the Commonwealth apply to us as well. If you go to Sydney, the laws of Victoria do not apply, the laws of New South Wales do, and the laws of the Commonwealth apply there as well. So it's a federal system, <coughs> more than one lawmaking body, making laws for the one location. If, 
and there are mechanisms put in if there are clashes, if the, Commo if the state has one law, Commonwealth has another, and they're inconsistent with each other. Section 109 states that the law of the Commonwealth will prevail. And if there's an argument over that, who decides? A new court system was created, the High Court of Australia. Okay. Some key factors uh, to note for the, um, in the Constitution. 51. And by the way, we, when I say the Constitution, I'm referring to the Commonwealth Constitution. But please note, each state has its own state constitution as well. That a constitution is a set of rules that, gov that dictate how an organisation will be run. The Commonwealth Constitution sets out the power sharing arrangement in this way. It says that there are 39 areas known as concurrent powers that can be shared, that can be undertaken by either the Commonwealth or the state. However, if the Commonwealth chooses to dominate that area, the state is then pushed out of it. Or it can be divided up in a different way. For example, tax is a concurrent power, but it was decided between the Commonwealth and the states that income tax would be uh, regulated by the Commonwealth but other taxes, such as land tax, would be um, the responsibilities of the state. 52, section 52, indicates what the exclusive powers are. And if you look at it, you think there's very few. Exclusive powers means the Commonwealth only can make laws for that area. For example, uh, defence. You cannot have a Victorian uh, army or navy. It's interesting, if you go to, to Port Phillip Bay around Black Rock, some of you might be aware of this, and look out into the water, you can see uh, a shipwreck. And it was a boat that belonged to the Victorian Navy, the Victorian colony, the colony Victoria's Navy in the 1800s. It's still there as a ruin. It's no longer possible for a state now to have its own militia. That is uh, the Commonwealth, uh, the area for the Commonwealth only. All right. Uh, and then after that, states and territories, if the, co if the Constitution does not refer to some specific area, then by default, it will be for the state to create laws. They're known as residual powers. Uh, health and transport are major areas there. Uh, in Australia, we have three areas of government, Commonwealth, state and local. You'll see the town hall in Melbourne, which is the Melbourne town hall for the Melbourne City Council. Wherever you are in Melbourne, wherever you are in Australia, there will be a local council. So where do they come from? They're not referred to in the Constitution. They are created by state parliaments. State parliaments have the power to create local governments. But, if those lo and, but the state parliaments also have the power to abolish or change those local governments. All right. Separation of powers. Now, this is a theory of government that we inherited. You find it in... Uh, OK, so this was created and it's part of the British system and so we inherited it. And other countries that inherited the British legal system, and that is countries that were once colonies, of Great Britain have this as well to varying extents. In the 1600s, it was a time of great political upheaval, times of revolutions and, and upset, 
In the 1700s, we saw the... In the 1600s, there was a war in England between the Parliament and the King. A civil war. And guess who won? Parliament won. The King lost. And what happened to that King? He was beheaded in the street. That was King Charles I. And we now have King Charles III. What was that over? Fights over the power of the monarch versus the power of Parliament. Because it was thought that, it was often said, uh, people are born free, yet everywhere they are in chains. Wherever you have government, you have tyranny. You have power. Wherever there's power, it tends to be abused. What's a way of avoiding that? Separation of powers was the answer. You, you divide the lawmaking powers into divisions. You separate the, 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 the organisations who can make laws and they keep a check on each other to prevent each other from abusing their power. The three branches are parliament, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. the judiciary. Judiciary is the courts. What's the executive? You might think, well, the executive is the king, uh, but in Australia, the king's, the power of the king is exercised by the governor general at Commonwealth level, governor in Victoria. But they, in turn, only act upon instructions given by the head of government, which is Commonwealth level, the Prime Minister and Cabinet, and com state level, the Premier and Cabinet. So the executive effectively is the Premier and Cabinet in Victoria, the Prime Minister and in every other state, Prime Minister and Cabinet at Commonwealth level. They are the executive. They instruct the Governor or Governor General as to how to exercise their power. The king actually has no power in England. And the king is represented in Australia by the governor, governor general. They have, it's debatable whether they have some power that's independent of the executive. Now, before your time, but within my lifetime, Australia was once in turmoil when I was a schoolboy not interested in any of these sorts of things, far too young. Suddenly the, the country was in turmoil because the Governor General acted without the power, without the instruction. The Governor General acted independently of the, of the Prime Minister by sacking the Prime Minister, by saying, Prime Minister, you and your government are no longer. So imagine today, if you found out in the news, that there's been no election, but suddenly Anthony Albanese is no longer the Prime Minister, the Labor Party is no longer the government. Why? Because the Governor-General signed a, uh, a letter saying that that's so, and that there would be new elections at some point, and that Peter Dutton now will be acting Prime Minister. The country was in turmoil because um, that result did not come about as a result... That result did not come about um, as a result of an election. Does the Governor-General have that power to do, to do that? Unfortunately, it never went to the High Court for the High Court to decide. It was decided politically. That is, a new election was held and the government that was sacked did not get back in. But no Governor or Governor-General has done that since. So, in theory, it remains that the Governor and Governor-General usually only ever act on the advice of the Premier or Prime Minister. Okay. So, it means, in a practical uh, way, a law can be passed by um, the Parliament. Someone might say the Commonwealth does not have the power under the Constitution to pass that law. Who decides? The court. 
and then the court may say, no, the parliament does, or no, the parliament does not. There's been very recently, just within the last few days, a decision by the High Court which has uh, had impact on people who have come, uh, been in detention in Australia, uh, who have come as migrants without authorisation. Okay, people, boat people, people have just turned up. They haven't come with any visa and they've been locked up in detention indefinitely. And the law that's permitted that has been challenged recently in the High Court in a way that's against, uh, it, at odds with the law. Okay. Sources of law. This is important. Please note that in our legal system, laws come from... Oh, oh, for, sorry, before I finish. This separation of powers is in place at both Commonwealth level and at state level. In, we have a Commonwealth Parliament and every state has its own Parliament. We have Commonwealth Courts. They, Commonwealth Courts are the courts that administer and apply the laws of the Commonwealth. But we have State Courts that administer and apply the laws of the states. So in each state you'll have a Magistrates Court, a County Court, in other states they're known as District Court, and a Supreme Court. That's where laws of that state will be heard, will be applied in matters. If you've been charged for murder in Victoria, it will go to the Supreme Court of Victoria. But if your matter involves a Commonwealth law, it will be, for example, that you in the Commonwealth Tax Department, it will be heard by a Commonwealth Court, for example, the Federal Court of Australia. The High Court is at the top of of every hierarchy. So it's the top court, uh, top of the state, and the top of hierarchy of the Commonwealth. We'll come back to that later. Sources of law. Laws are created either by courts or by statute. The first area that we're going through from next week, and it dominates this subject, is the law of contract. The law of contract has been created by a series of cases over the centuries, most of them in the 1800s and early 1900s. Most of them were in England. There is no contract act. There's no act of parliament that says this is what a contract is, this is what a contract must be, and this is what happened if a contract is breached. It's all case law. But other matters are... For example, um, family law, which we don't teach. But corporations law, which we do. The laws there come from legislation. And in company law, which we'll see in the final two weeks, it comes from Commonwealth legislation because the Commonwealth has the power. Okay. That's Parliament House in Canberra. Whenever, how are, how are laws made? How, are, um, how is legislation made? To further complicate matters, parliaments, except for in, New South, except for in um, Queensland, the states and the Commonwealth have parliaments and they have two houses, a lower house and an upper house. They have various names. The upper house of the Commonwealth is known as the Senate. For... A proposal to become a law, a proposed law is known as a bill and if it is passed it becomes legislation. It has to be voted on and agreed to by a majority of members of both houses, lower and then upper. And then if both of them are, uh, agree, then it goes to the Governor General who will sign it into law. But it's not simply, like today, here we are in the lower house of parliament, here's a proposal, vote on it, yes or no. There are three um, discussions that take place. The first is fairly simple, where the bill is introduced, 
where the government, and it's the government who has the job of introducing the laws, they will explain to the House uh, what, the law, what it's about. That's known as the first reading speech. After that is a longer um, process known as the second reading speech. The proposed law is then debated. And the members might choose to get some experts to do some investigation and report back to them so it can take some time. Then the third reading is when uh, the proposal is in its final draft before it's voted on. If it's approved, it then goes to the upper house and the same process occurs. But in Australia, it can be a tricky matter because often the government has... A, you will be government in Australia if your party has the majority in the lower house. But usually, that government does not have a majority in the upper house. So they have to uh, try and seek the approval of... Uh, members in the upper house from other parties. That process goes through in the same... It's the same process in the state parliaments as well. You can click on that link in your own time for some more information. All right. Laws can uh, be created by parliament. And then... But sometimes there can still be some ambiguity as to what it means. One of the most famous rules in Australia which will be taught to you later in the year, is Section 18 of the Consumer Law. It's probably the most important commercial law of all. Not necessarily for exams or assignments, but just in day-to-day -day, uh, regulation of commerce and industry. And it states that a person in trade or commerce must not engage in conduct that is misleading or deceptive or likely to mislead or deceive. Section 18 of the Consumer Law. A person... Now, the Act states that person includes companies. It says a person in trade or commerce, but the Act doesn't say what trade or commerce includes or excludes. So if you go into a shop and buy the book over the counter, trade or commerce, seems like it. What then when I sell my book privately to another person? for a price, is that trade or commerce as well? Now, that has gone to the High Court in the past, and the High Court has interpreted that word of statute in a limited way to say that trade or commerce must be within the context of the seller's ordinary business. So if you go and buy something from a bookshop, a book from a bookshop, it is in trade or commerce because the bookshop sells books. It's part of their normal business. But if you buy a book from someone personally and their job is not a bookseller, they work as a um, builder, then the Section 18 does not apply to them because they're not in trade or commerce. But that qualification comes from a court case where the court interpreted the words of the statute in that way. All right. Now, when the courts have the task of interpreting the wording of the statute, it's not just up to what the, they make it on a... They still have to follow rules when they make that interpretation. They can't... The judges can't just say, well, look, this is what I think should be the answer. It's based on what I feel like. They have to follow rules. There were... Um, common law rules which were based on court cases from England from hundreds, over hundreds of years. The literal rule, the golden rule, the mischief rule. The literal rule being first try and give the words their literal dictionary meaning. And if that makes sense, then fine, that's it. But if there's still ambiguity, then you move on to the golden rule which means you can have the judges can then look for context in the rest of the Act to see um, uh, what the wording should be. Mischief was, well, what was the problem that this legislation tried to solve? 
But today in Australia, we have a modern approach and it's known as the purposive approach. And it's found in legislation in the states for when the state courts interpret law and the Commonwealth courts for when the Commonwealth courts interpret law. Purposive approach just simply means that the judges are to have regard to what the purpose of the law was. Now, how do they find out what the purpose was? They can look at extrinsic materials. What is that? Materials that's outside the actual legislation. For example, they can look at the second reading speech in Parliament when the minister said the purpose of this legislation is to do this. Or well, the court can have regard to that under this modern approach, the purposive approach, in making its interpretation. Okay. Now, common law is a term you've probably heard, probably haven't got a very good understanding of what it means. Well, it can mean different things in different situations. Just like the word country can mean we all, we're all here in a country, we're in Australia, we're not in New Zealand, we're in a country. But country can also mean rural areas, trees and paddocks and animals, country or city. We're here in Melbourne at the moment, we're in the city, we're not in the country. But a moment ago we said we're in a country, Australia, and not that other country. So country can mean different things in different contexts. So can the term common law. Originally, common law meant, and this is still one of the meanings, judge-made law, case-made law, law that was created by cases. So the law of contract is common law. Where did that come from? What's common about it? Well, in England, the theory was that if a court decides in a particular manner, other courts should follow that same decision so that there's consistency of the law throughout the land. However, that could lead to rigidity. So if, someone might, might, if a bad decision was made, that means the whole country is locked in with it. So it works this way. There will be hierarchy of courts. And actually, I'll come to here. A hierarchy of courts. At the state level, we have low courts, magistrates court. Uh, for more serious matters, we have intermediate courts. Known, in Victoria, it's known as the county court. In uh, other states, that court is known as the district court. Then above that, the Supreme Court. So in England, there are courts and they have hierarchies. Now, if a decision is made by a court that is higher, that decision will be binding. It's known as precedent, binding precedent, on the courts that are lower. So the law is common in that way. Once a high court a higher court, such as the Supreme Court, makes a decision, it will be binding on lower courts. There's a further complication to that in that in Australia, of course, because we have, unlike England, because we have the Commonwealth and we also have a lot of states, six states, they all have their own courts. So common law... Precedent works in this way. A decision of a higher court is binding precedent, meaning it's a law that must be followed by courts that are below it in the same, but only in that same hierarchy. Now, this is important to note. It often turns up in questions in exams and, or first assessments or something. So, for example, the Supreme Court of South Australia it's a top court in the state hierarchy there. The magistrate's court in Victoria is the lowest court in the Victorian hierarchy. Is a decision of, and a decision is made 
by the Supreme Court in South Australia. Will that be binding precedent on the Magistrates Court in Victoria? The answer is no. Why? It is a superior court, yes, but it's not in the same hierarchy. What do I mean by hierarchy? It's not the same state. Now, it doesn't mean that that decision will be just meaningless. That decision will be known as persuasive precedent. The court, the magistrate's court, will probably follow it. It doesn't have to, though. Persuasive precedent, but it's not binding. It doesn't have to. Whereas if the Supreme Court of Victoria makes a decision, then the county court and the magistrate's court must not make a decision that's inconsistent with that. They must follow that rule because it's precedent but it's binding upon them. Remember the Commonwealth, they are in a separate hierarchy. So a decision of the federal court is not binding on any state court. A decision of any state court is not binding on any Commonwealth court. However, the High Court itself is the top of every hierarchy. So if the High Court of Australia makes a decision, it must be followed by every court in every hierarchy, Commonwealth and State. There's the High Court. Okay. Below that is on Commonwealth is the Federal Court of Australia. And there's also what is known as the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia. They used to be separate courts, now they're merged into one. Uh, what can I say here? Oh, okay, classification of laws. Uh, there's not a lot that really that you have to um, pay attention to on this slide. It's just that laws can be categorised in different ways. Uh, uh, under different headings, different labels. We've got public law. That's law that applies equally to everyone. For example, the criminal law applies to me, it applies to you, it applies to everyone. Whereas there are private laws. Contract law is private. The obligations under that contract only apply to people who are parties to that contract, to members of that contract. If this person over here and that person over there enter into a legally binding contract, both of them have rights and obligations to each other. But those rights and obligations only apply to those two. It doesn't involve us. So that's an example of private law. Okay. Uh, crim all right, there is civil law, and another way of categorising is civil and criminal. Most, the 90% of the law that we are dealing with in this subject is civil. So please, if someone has done something wrong, for example, they've breached a contract, please don't say that the wrongdoer is guilty. That terminology applies to criminal law. If you break a contract, no one goes to jail. You, you're not the, the, if there's a debate in a civil matter in court, not a debate, a dispute in court in a civil matter, for example, in contract, neither party is the state. Whenever this, for example, if it's a criminal law matter, one side will be representing the state. The police will be a witness and one of those uh, lawyers there is representing the state. And if you've done the wrong thing, the state will impose a penalty, a fine or imprisonment. So it's a person and the state. But in private law, the state is not a party. So if Susan is in a contract with Jill and there's a contract dispute and they're in court, one party will be Susan, the other Jill. The state is not involved. It's not a party anyway. The court themselves, the judge, is, the, is a representative of the state, but they're not a party. 
So if Jill is found to have breached her contract, she's not guilty. Guilty, guilt, refers to a, an offence against the criminal law. The term is actually liable, to be liable, L-I-A-B-L-E. So if you've broken a contract, you're liable and you can be obliged to compensate the other party. Liable, and the name for that compensation is damages, which we'll talk to you later. So the wrongdoer can be held liable for damages. No innocence, no guilt. So please don't use that terminology. All right. We have domestic and international law. I'll leave you to read that. Um, okay. We know that if there's a dispute and um, that you can go to court. If there's a legal dispute where you claim that another person has broken the law, for example, they've broken uh, a legally binding contract or they've broken the criminal law, then you can go to court. Please note, though, guys, I need your attention. Please, hello, I need you to maintain concentration, please. Going to court is a long and expensive process. If you read today the outcome in the newspaper of a, a matter that's in court, chances are the actual events happened years ago. It takes years before it goes to court. And there's a lot of time and a lot of expense involved. Now, for cr civil matters only, not criminal, for civil matters we now have a par another pathway. It's known as an alternative, dis or alternate or alternative dispute resolution. Under civil law disputes such as contract, tort, negligence, the courts at all times encourage the parties to try and come to, try and resolve the matter themselves. There are different ways of doing that. Through negotiation, through mediation, when there's a mediator and they listen to he encourage both sides to discuss their grievances and try and see if they can find some compromise, something that they can both live together. Or conciliation, where both parties sign up and say, we agree that a third party will hear our matter and make a decision and that we will follow the outcome. We see that in tribunals, for example, VTAC, VCAT, I'm sorry, not VTAC, VCAT, Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal. And if they're unsuccessful, you can still go through the court system. Okay. Often, though, a court will refuse to hear a contract matter if the parties haven't fir cannot show that they first attempted uh, to undergo some form of alternate dispute resolution. All right. Now we come to the final slide. Uh, one thing to let you know for homework, let's just look ahead now to week two. Scroll to week two, please. Week two contract. Slide, uh, there's the PowerPoint slides for the class, the lecture that I'll be giving this time uh, on Tuesday next week. But scroll down to the seminar activities and resources. Please click on that document. Just waiting for it to open. All right. Now, there are a number of questions there. The Australian legal system. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven questions. They're the questions that we will be going through in the seminar next Friday afternoon and online on Wednesday evening. So please try and sketch together some answers. This week, for that, for that particular exercise, it's quite straightforward. It's almost like just copy and paste from 
content in chapter 1. There's no IRAC, meaning there's none of that special methodology. In the Wednesday online seminar and this afternoon, again, I will be explaining to you the methodology that you must follow when you're answering legal questions. But that's only for homework from week three onwards. Not just homework, but for your assignments and for the exams. So it's very important that you come today to get some understanding. But it doesn't apply to these questions for next week's seminar because it's just... For ex it's just uh, explain the doctrine of separation of powers. So it's just, you know, almost like a copy and paste of the information that you see in the textbook there. That's, but that's for next week only. From then on, you will be told Jack and Jill uh, talk business. Then there was a dispute, and now Jack is so, wants to sue Jill for $5,000. Does Jill have to pay? Well, you have to think, well, what's the relevant rule there? So you have to go through issue, rule, application, conclusion. It's not just copy and paste. You could copy and paste the rule, but you, there's no application that you can copy and paste. There's no conclusion. So you have to understand the rule, but know how to apply it. That methodology I introduced to you uh, this afternoon and you would follow that from week three onwards in the seminar questions, both assignments and in the exam. That's all I have for you today. Thank you for your attention, everyone. I look forward to seeing you in our seminar, which is over the bridge. Okay, thank you, online students. Uh, if there's any query or uh, you can let me know. Uh, yes, sorry, I see some of the online students about um, <coughs> seeing what's on the slide. You can, yes, you can download them and access them because what I have, the slides that I have, this is for online students, the online slides that I show are just from week one. So uh, you, you have access to the same slides that I see. I'm sorry if they're blurred. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. So, um, all right. I'll end the online session, uh, and you can listen to this recording at any time later on. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.